So we've just seen the very first documented um, examples of the spin. Now we're going to look at the first documented spin flight tests. These were conducted by Lindemann uh, at Farnborough in England in 1918. Um, so a good seven or eight years after the first spin was documented but basically Lindemann had developed a mathematical model to pre predict spin dynamics of a particular aircraft and then within the space of a couple of months taught himself to fly in order to test out his theories um, so he, sp he uh, conducted a sp spin tests of two RAF biplanes and he did this by putting a, a camera on the ground and performing the spins above it to um, try to reconstruct um, characteristics of the spin, like the spin radius, for example. And he also took other data um, by hand in the cockpit as he was performing these uh, spins, um, basically jotting down information from the altimeter and using a stopwatch. So obviously uh, a very dangerous and experimental thing to be doing. And he was also able to record approximate um, attitude of the aircraft, giving some indication of the angle of attack um, by basically monitoring the attitude indicator in the cockpit. And he found that his flight tests agreed pretty well uh, with his mathematical model and he observed a spin frequency of uh, a quarter of a hertz so uh, each spin took four seconds if you want to think of it like that and these particular aircraft had a spin radius of around about six meters um, around about the same time in America NACA um, were looking at similar tests with a Curtis JN4H and found similar results for that aircraft spin frequency of slightly higher than what Lindemann found and um, they were using uh, an, a newly developed uh, angular velocity sensor which we're going to talk about um, shortly. Now, fast forwarding uh, 10 or 11 years to the next significant milestone in spin flight testing, um, Wright uh, was able to um, record 30 seconds worth of data for a spin that included 11 different parameters, as you can see on these traces here on the right hand side, for a spin in a Bristol fighter, which you can see is this British biplane here. Now, one thing to point out um, here is the bottom three traces there. You can see the rudder, elevator, and the ailerons. You can see, obviously, the uh, step input made to the rudder to initiate the spin. Obviously, the elevator is held fully back throughout the whole spin. And then on the right-hand side of those traces there, you can see the correct corrective action made by right to the rudder deflecting it in the opposite direction to oppose the spin the yawing effect and also to push the uh, stick forward um, to uh, change the elevator deflection in order to reduce the angle of attack also notice that the ailerons were neutral throughout the whole spin um, that's what we call a neutral spin so that's what the control positions were doing in those particular tests. Um, looking at the uh, traces above that, you can see time histories for um, normal acceleration, roll rate, pitch rate, yaw rate, and so on. And also the altitude, um, which is that, um, that final trace there before the control position traces. And these results show that the uh, roll rate changes quickly in the incipient stage of the spin and for this particular aircraft anyway stabilizes almost immediately in the develop stage. Um, you can see that the yaw rate um, steadily increases throughout these five um, turns uh, before uh, right initiates the recovery but it's the pitch rate here which is 
uh, of most interest because it displays this oscillatory behavior. Um, and this was very common of, of aircraft and spin studies in this particular um, era. Uh, and it shows slight damping but it doesn't stabilize before the recovery. We still get this oscillatory behavior in pitch rate. Moving on another couple of years and over to the US, NACA were also performing tests, uh, tests developed by Sol and Scudder. Um, they were also able to produce traces of uh, five parameters, time histories of five parameters for an NY-1 biplane that you can see down here uh, at the bottom of the screen, a US Navy biplane, and they found some very similar results. This particular aircraft, which was similar to the Bristol fighter studied by Wright that we just discussed, had a very similar spin frequency around about 0.4 hertz. Uh, for left-hand spins and slightly higher for right-hand spins. Uh, they also found that spinning to the left had a slightly tighter radius than spinning to the right. So of course what they had discovered there was the yawing effect of the very significant wooden propeller and the moment of inertia uh, there which contributes to that um, changing yawing effect. Um, they also did some, some further tests um, looking at changing the mass distribution of the aircraft and how that changed characteristics of the spin, uh, basically by moving um, some buckets of lead shot forwards and backwards within the fuselage, again pure experimental style there, and they found that their spin frequencies varied between 0.27 and 0.54 hertz, and spin radii uh, changed somewhere between 1 and 3 meters. Sol and Scudder also conducted spin tests using this Fleet Model 1, again looking at how the mass distribution of the aircraft changed characteristics of the spin, and you can see that they uh, found some very similar spin frequencies and spin radii as they had done a couple of years previous. So as I mentioned earlier, all of this spin flight testing was basically being fed back into aircraft design, um, specifically looking at the design of the tail section of an aircraft. So th in this particular study here, which you can see from these photographs, Scudder and Seedman, they conducted um, some spin flight tests on this um, early Boeing aircraft uh, biplane looking at basically different configurations of the tail section. So in these um, seven photographs here you can see various tail designs for this particular aircraft. You can see large, uh, larger surface area vertical sections. You can see different positions for the horizontal uh, section of the tail and so on. And they were looking to see which particular configuration um, led to good or bad spin characteristics and how easy or difficult it was to recover from that. Um, this aircraft uh, had a very um, bad reputation for, for dangerous spin tendencies which is why they were looking to redesign the tail section and in order to help the pilot out a little bit if um, they were to get into trouble um, a parachute was attached to the tail of the aircraft to aid recovery should the pilot find himself in an uncontrollable or unrecoverable spin. So again, pure experimental um, uh, fashion here. A lot of these early tests <laughs> didn't necessarily have uh, health and safety in mind. They were just trying to find the right answers um, in the, in the uh, quickest possible way, right? Um, so in this particular test, uh, among, among other conclusions, um, it was noted that the, uh, the fin, if, if, if the designer increased the area of the fin and raised the horizontal um, tail surfaces, this had the greatest effect in aiding spin recovery. So for the largest vertical tail section area with the highest, um, like a T-tail, 
was the easiest to recover from a spin. And they fed this information back, compared the results with um, spinning balance uh, scale model tests and were able to, to um, solidify these findings and then ultimately um, change the design of the tail of this aircraft. So finally then we're just going to jump forward to the 1950s. Obviously there was a gap in research in the 40s um, due to the Second World War. But the next significant milestone in flight testing of the spin was conducted by Kerr and he conducted some flight tests in this uh, Balliol Mark II um, uh, and conducted tests of both the spin and for the first time the inverted spin. And um, Kerr was able to find some typical characteristics similar to those that we've seen before from the, the, the previous tests angles of attack between 21 and a half and 52 degrees typical spin frequencies as we've seen before and also um, as was characteristic of some of those early tests in those um, time history traces that I, I showed you just just a minute ago oscillations were apparent in several other parameters as well and uh, Kerr made a conjecture about why this was and and put it down to basically at the outer wing tip continually stalling itself and unstalling um, during the spin which he attributed to those oscillations in those parameters. So all of these early results that we've just discussed are characteristic of modern aircraft too and very similar to results that are found uh, in the present day using modern techniques and modern equipment. So it's, it's a testament to the early pioneers of this particular field that they were able to find um, very um, typical and um, characteristic features of the aircraft spin with what little they had available to them at the time.